Hello and welcome to Horse Player Happy Hour. This is our show for Friday, October 30th, uh, the eve of Halloween. I'm coming to you not from Walt Whitman uh, Brewing Company, but from an undisclosed location on the way to the Breeders' Cup. I think one or two of you may recognize the conference room where I'm in. Big bonus points if you put that one in the comments. But uh, thrilled to be here. This is what we've been waiting for. The event, Horse Players, really keeps the, keeps the blood pumping. Throughout the year, Breeders' Cup upon us here for Horse Players Happy Hour. Uh, PTF Peter Thomas Fortetel joined as typically on these broadcasts by a man you'll recognize from all the fine work he's done uh, on uh, on the on the little screen on your on your computer on his podcast uh, that shares his name. I'm talking, of course, about the one, the only TV's Matt Bernier. How are you, my friend? I'm good, Pete. You know, I woke up this morning to a bit of a shocker when I looked out the window and saw that we had three inches of snow. But that's <laughs> what are you going to do? That's a Halloween miracle, if you will. Um, but it's I tell you what, it, it, it's going to make getting down to Lexington next week that much sweeter because knock on wood, anything can happen. But I think we're lined up for two phenomenal days weather wise uh, for the Breeders' Cup next week, which is a pleasant surprise because at this time of year, basically all around the country, but especially sort of starting down there through that area and moving on up north, you never know what you're going to get. It's so true. And it, it looks like we're getting lucky. I'm already starting to factor in a little bit of firmer turf than I thought we were going to have. Of course, this is all subject to change. I did have a cheeky uh, Saratoga-based, uh, near enough Saratoga-based friend. He's actually uh, from L.A picture of the snow today and say this is why we can't have a uh, breeder's cup at saratoga and uh, I'm, I'm afraid he's he's probably right about that one it's just it, it was one of those things so we had heard earlier in the week oh chance it's going to be cold on friday but you're just going to probably have some rain and it'll stay north up into new hampshire and maine and i wake up this morning and it's like a blizzard outside and i'm like what what did i miss it's still snowing right now and while it <laughs> oh while God. it's not yeah, I mean, while it's nothing, you know, if this was January, it would just be kind of a pain in the rear end. But for October 30th, I mean, get me to get me to Thanksgiving before the <laughs> snow shows up. That's all I ask. You're not going to be one of those guys out there with the skis uh, oh. trying to trying to show off and make the best of it. You're 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 just disgusted. I have a 10 o'clock tea time Sunday morning. I don't know that that's going to happen. <laughs> yeah, you have some black golf balls to yeah, see if you can find yeah. it in the snow. It just, it's one of those things. And actually, I brought it up, too, to um, somebody who made a comment on Twitter. A number of years ago um, in Massachusetts and New England in general, there was a snowstorm right around this time. And it snowed considerably more than it is today. But the problem was there were still a number of leaves still on the trees and the weight of the snow yeah. on top of the limbs that can be brought everything down, destroyed power for, I think my parents were out for almost 10 days. I know many people oh. were out for two weeks. We're not going to get to that point here, knock on wood. Um, but it is something at least to, to consider because we still, we still have plenty of leaves on the trees. Getting ready to head down to Lexington. What are your main responsibilities next week? What are you, what are you going to be up to? NBC, NBCSN, Thursday, Friday, Saturday. We'll have the Betting the Breeders' Cup show on Thursday afternoon. That'll be live. And then we will have the two days, Friday and Saturday, obviously, uh, NBCSN all day on Friday. And then we'll open on SN on Saturday and then transition about 2, 2.30 to, uh, to the network proper. But then, obviously, we'll have our, our big sort of extravaganza show next week. Looking forward to that with you and JK. Um, and just a little bit of everything, trying to, you know, Dot all the I's, cross all the T's as we get closer and closer to heading down there. I love the sound of that. And you do mention a good thing, uh, the, the show we traditionally do. We've gotten a few calls about it already, emails, folks wanting to know if we're going to do the traditional crossover, uh, Players Podcast, Mapper News Show. We're going to do it, and it's going to be right here on Horse Players Happy Hour on, uh, on I think, Wednesday. Still trying to figure out the logistics of that. Uh, Producer Craig, if you're listening, remind me. we got to talk about that later if we can possibly have the three of us in one place. It, it seems like such a great opportunity to try to do that if we can arrange it technically. If not, we'll we'll retreat to our uh, our neutral corners and 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 tackle it that way but that's just part of the content there's so much stuff going to be happening 
on in the money podcast.com. I've just, I've done all the recording for our monster pods. I now just have to stitch them together. It's quite a quilt. Uh, a lot of names, your, your NBC colleagues are going to be involved there. Uh, last two folks I talked to were actually uh, Brittany Hurt and, and, and Randy Moss, their names, JK. I don't even want to start listing them because then I should list them all. <laughs> it, it, it's the best array of talent we've ever had for, uh, for our, our monster pods. And, and, you know, I've been very proud of everything we've done with them in the past. So folks can check that out in the money podcast.com, some special stuff over at in the money podcast.com slash BC as well. If folks want to check that out now, Let's tell folks why we're here. A little bit different today as we're already in the midst of the contest. So I do not need to spend any time exhorting people to play in this feeder because uh, that proverbial horse is already out of the barn. We had a fantastic turnout today, 99 entries playing. Basically what folks were looking to do in this one is feed into Saturday's final Breeders' Cup. Actually, it might not be the final. There might be some action next week on horseplayers.com, but final Saturday, BCBC qualifier. The special thing about the shows uh, that we do here the, and the feeders that go with them is all of the rake goes to charity. Thoroughbred Aftercare Alliance, who accredit all the equine uh, charities and also our friends at the Thoroughbred Retirement Foundation, our founding partners at In the Money Media and the great work they do rehousing thoroughbreds and also uh, the interactions between horses and people through their second chances program. So here's the good news. You've missed that, but the good news is lots of opportunities and some really creative, what you might call high roller type events as well. We're right now feeding into the $179 game on Saturday where the entry is one in 65, but there's also, I think it's a $500 ish buy-in where it's a one in 23 when they're BCBC seat. And I think there's even a thousand dollar one where it's like one in 11. Yes. So, so many chances. Go to horseplayers.com, check it out. Matt Bernier has finished high up in the money at the Breeders' Cup betting challenge before. He's already won his way in uh, via one ticket. Have you made a final decision? Are you going to be going to this single handed or are you thinking about trying to win or shell out for another one? I took a little bit of a shot earlier this morning with the uh, the sort of last second feeder to try to get into today's $500 entry. Didn't work out. And it was genuinely, I think I signed up with two minutes to post. I hadn't looked at any of the races. <laughs> I mean, it was the ultimate speed handicapping. Um, I may take another shot if there are any at the beginning of next week. Um, I won't be buying in again at that point. I, I, I feel like worst case scenario, I've got my one and we'll take our shot. I feel pretty good. But um and all along, I think a couple of weeks ago, I had said to you, I had no intention of trying for a second one. You know what is it? We get a little bit closer. I, I don't think it can hurt. I mean, the, the worst case scenario, you take a couple shots, it doesn't work. Best case, you grab another seat. And, and at that point, it's an entirely different ball game. So I'll probably take a couple little swings, but it won't be anything dramatic. That is the great thing about the extra entry in the live bankroll. You don't I look, I think they're advantageous even in mythical money format, but they can also be very obviously vexing. And the phenomenon of, of split tickets has uh, caused many a horse player to pull his or her hair out of their head. And I mean that literally uh, with um, live bank, it's, it's just more bullets to have. And, and if people were on the fence about it and uh, are in a position financially where they're going to be betting uh, big money anyway, Breeders' Cup weekend, it's something that you might want to consider doing. Just so for folks who don't know, ten thousand dollar live bankroll competition, seventy five hundred of that you actually bet uh, through the windows through the course of those two days in the dedicated pools, and then the other twenty five hundred goes to a prize pool that gets paid back at more than a hundred percent. So it's a great uh, value opportunity, I believe, for the serious horse player. If you're betting this kind of money, you might as well bet it in the context of the contest. I have to imagine that you've won contests, you've had big scores, you've accomplished a, a lot in the media side of the game. Where for you does that high up finish at the Breeders' Cup Betting Challenge back in, I think, 2014 mm -hmm. rank for you among your horse playing achievements, Matt? Well, I think for me, it's it's very much a nostalgic thing because I think it was still in that time frame. And look, there are still people today that would look at me and say, you're a bum. You don't know what you're talking about. But <laughs> I think at that time, especially, I was still so new. I mean, it was really my first year working for the racing form. Uh, it was my first year doing anything really extensive with NBC. And I felt like it was at least an opportunity to to prove like, OK, there are some chops here. I think everyone just kind of had remembered me from 
the the reality show for the folks that weren't paying attention to the racing form stuff. So it at least offered me an opportunity, I felt, to try to show that this was not, you know, just entirely right place at the right time, that there were there was something there. Um, and obviously it was a, a great run. Um, I wish I could have done a little bit better, but it, I think in the grand scheme of things, it was a pretty good first effort. And then, you know, so many people kind of pointed it out. I played that year. Uh, it was all for charity and we donated it to Aftercare. And um, uh, many people pointed out that it was just good karma because then I came back and won Aqueduct two weeks later. So right. it was, it, I, I felt really good. And I'll always look back on that and say, you know what? People say what they want and they'll either like you or they won't. But when push came to shove, I felt like I delivered in that situation when I kind of needed to prove my mettle. Um, the following year in 2015 at Keeneland, which is the last time I played in this event, um, I look at that in a much different light. I look at that more as I made, I feel like a couple tactical errors and it's, it's easy to, you know, it's, it's the ultimate red board. You can always go back and look at it and say, oh, well, I knew this and I should have done this, that, and the other thing. Um, if I could have gone back and done it differently, I would have, and I'm hopeful that I have learned from that sort of contest and that event and, and also learning from 2014. And hopefully I can use that to my advantage here, uh, next weekend. And it'd be a host fail if I didn't ask you to pause on that topic for a minute, because I bet some of these lessons you're talking about that you can learn are things that people watching could learn as well. What did you do wrong in 15 and what are you going to do right in 20 back in the same location right there at Keeneland? Well, and I can almost just kind of compare and contrast 14 to 15, where 14, my, my big opinion of the weekend was a horse called Texas Red who won the juvenile. And I based more or less everything around that race saying, if I'm right, I'm going to have something to play with and be in co good position going forward. And that's exactly how it played out in 15. My big opinion was Stephanie's kitten in the Philly and Mare turf. And I know we've all had a good time with going back and watching the tape of that, but I didn't, I don't think I hammered the opinion enough. I, I played it enough where I more or less got back to even from where I started but in, I, I guess in, in hindsight, I probably should have looked at that and said, rather than, I, I can't remember all the specifics, but I think I had a thousand to win on her. I missed out on an exact, I missed out on the trifecta. So in the grand scheme of things, I think I only turned about 8,000 on the race, which is fine. But I, in hindsight, knowing that that was the only real opinion I had for the entire day, I probably should have just pushed in on that situation and said, you know what, if I'm right, we're going to be in really good shape. And then I can get a little more creative as opposed to just sort of treading water. And and, and I don't think I really gave myself an opportunity to win by not emphasizing and, and hammering that opinion enough. It's very hard playing for charity. I've, I've been in the yeah. possession of making a $5,000 wager for, for charity before. And it, uh, it, it gnaws at you and it messes with you, I think a little bit in a way where when you're playing for yourself and you're playing for your own money, we obviously have you know, we wouldn't do what we did, what we do if we didn't have, you know, gambler mentalities. But I mean, just especially thinking back to the example in 14, um, what kind of a jerk do you feel like if you push all in after you built up your bankroll to God, whatever it was in 30, 40,000 and you lose it all? Like it, it, you know, in a sense, because you were, you're such a good guy and you're doing the right thing and you're playing for charity, you were also playing maybe with one hand tied behind your back. Well, and that was the thing that so many people, uh, I shouldn't say so many, this was actually one instance where I was pleasantly surprised at the, the response I got. There were some people that said, well, it's it's easy to play with someone else's money. And no, I said, it's, it's, not. It, it's not, no, especially when we got to that position where it wasn't like it was, and I'm not downplaying the $20 buy-in that we play for every week with the, the happy hour. But I mean, we were into the tens of thousands of dollars. And I said, well, it was almost like a blessing and a curse where once the Breeders' Cup sprint happened and I hit work all week, 19 to one, get 19 grand out of it or 18 to one, whatever it was. And, I, and at that point I was just, I think right around 40,000 and I went to first and we had two or three races left. It was almost a blessing and a curse because at that point it was almost like the, the little switch in my head flicked and I said, I want to win, but you got to do it. I said, what, what, but I can't go blowing this thing. I can't, you know, it would, even if I ended up losing 20 grand trying to win it, I, I would still feel like a real heel yeah. If all of a sudden I went to the folks when we were you know chopping it up saying you could have had this instead you've got a half or a third of it like so it was it was a little bit of a difficult position in 15 I will say it was a 50-50 split between my own money and the other half going to charity so it was a slightly different dynamic but there is still that element of you know you, you don't want to 
totally go crazy with it because you'd feel like a real jerk if you had something and then you couldn't do anything afterward. Um, this year, it's just me. And, you know, obviously, if I do very well, uh, I'm certainly not against donating some, but it is it is a different mentality, I think, this year going in, where as much as I'm cognizant of that, this is, this is real money, and I, I get it, everyone's at different levels. Um, I would be lying if I said that, you know, on any other point in the year, I'm going to be betting $7,500 over two days. That's just not my mentality. I play for much small. I'm a, I'm a $30, $40, $50 dollar win player. That's more or less what I am on a day-to-day basis. Um, you have to kind of adjust that mindset for an event like this if you want to have any real chance of winning. And and I'm I'm very I'm very excited. I feel like I'm going in in good form. There are interesting races. There are horses that keep that I just my eyes keep going to, and and I will have them prominently on both days. Hopefully, if I have enough money left on Saturday. But um, yeah, it's definitely a different mindset when you're in it for yourself as opposed to playing with someone else's money. Yeah, and I'm totally with you. I, I think the, the someone else's money makes it so, so hard to show the kind of aggressiveness you need. Can't wait to see how you do this year. Obviously, rooting for you and everybody who's won their way, started their journey to this thing through our Horse Player Happy Hours. There's a few of you out there. We want to hear from folks who are playing in the BCBC. And if you have questions, feel free to hit us up on Twitter. We, we'd love to to talk and, and guide and hopefully share some of what we've learned. I've never played in the damn thing, but I've covered it for uh, the last seven or eight years. And Matt's got his firsthand experience. If you've got Breeders' Cup betting challenge questions, feel free to throw them our way. Let's talk about this leaderboard, Matt. We have, as I mentioned, I think I mentioned that we had 99 people playing. That means 10 folks are going to win their entries to the $179 qualifier on Halloween, uh, Saturday, tomorrow. And, of course, you can buy your way in directly to that as well. Just This is a nice way to try to do it for 20 bucks help in charity. I'm going to read the names that are currently um, – in position. We have two races to go. We, we mix it up on these shows. Some weeks we do the three tracks and the, it's a quick contest. Today we're going back to that six pack model. How perfect for happy hour. We, and it also harkens back to a bet that I, I miss terribly. The old school, uh, the old school pick six uh, <laughs> when it's races. Oh, it's a little different today. We're four through nine. Sometimes we do it races three through eight, but here's the 10 names. T- David Browning, in first right now, 51-20. Kevin Harrell, second, 46-10 in a tie with Kenneth P. Yingling with the same amount. Hey, speaking of the old Horse Players TV show, where many of us first saw Matt Berdier, Lee Davis, your castmate from there, currently in fourth, 45-90. Chuck Lefebvre in fifth with 43-90. Mark Rudy, sixth, 36-10. John J. Macklin, seventh, 27 Stephen Close or Stephen Klaus, who I know from Twitter. I thought he was a thought he was a Brit. They let Brits play in this thing now. Also um, <laughs> among the many with 27, that includes Thomas Bryan, Tim Herbeth, um, and I think that's our 10 right there. Yes. So it's uh, it's a, it looks like a very it's a competitive contest, folks. Uh, a lot of names. I'm, I'm scrolling down. A lot of people have been supporting this game every week. It's been great to see and uh, and. and you know, we'll we'll get this this concept will will ride again, folks. And if you're if you just listen to the shows, I know um, some people li- go back and watch this video. If you don't join us live or they listen to the podcast, get involved. And and I love these concepts. And hopefully, we'll get we'll get more and more stuff like this going. We have our next race coming up in a few minutes here. Why don't we talk about this? Well, sometimes I leave this too late. Let's talk about this nice and early, Matt, this eighth race at Belmont today. Um, we'll go over this one and then maybe we'll, we'll talk about some of these races. Yep. Uh, we'll, we'll pick a few to preview. Maybe we'll do a little buy, sell, hold with the current international prices. Why not? That might be, I like that. that's always a fun game to play and, and could be, could be very helpful to folks out there making their preliminary plans. But let's start off with this eighth race at Belmont. What did you think? So, I, you know, I got a little bit kooky in here, and, and I'm, I'm sure this is not a super popular opinion based on the tote board anyway. Um, I gave the six blunt force a little bit of a look. Uh, Ten to one on the line. First off the claim for relatively low profile connections. Uh, I get it. The horse is 0 for 5 on a wet track, which isn't ideal that we're dealing with sloppy. And obviously they're off the turf down there in Elmont. Um 11 to one on the board opened up right around 15. So it's not like we saw any kind of sneaky money or I didn't interpret it that way anyway. Um, I just, you know, this is a horse stepping back up in class, which if you go through the overall body of work, we're dealing with a horse who 
sort of, if you want to say the air quotes, best win was for open 12-5. So, I mean, this is a tremendous jump up. I always find it interesting. And I know it's, you know, some people roll their eyes when they hear about the idea of trying to play where riders land and things of that nature. For a lower profile outfit, for Luis Saez to take the mountain here on this horse, I, I just found it a little bit curious. And I wasn't blown away by anyone else in here. You know, I, I look at a horse like Jump for Joy, relatively soft pace situation that most recent run still couldn't get it done. I get it. The Sakari ran quite well that day, but I just didn't think anyone in here deserved to be a tremendously short price. I wanted to shop a little bit. The horse looked overmatched from a class standpoint, but from a numbers standpoint, I don't think it's all that far off. And again, the size factor I thought was interesting enough, far from a likely winner, but I went with the six blunt force. I, I understand the case. I saw this pace really holding together with Jump for Joy and No Deal out there, and I thought they might turn it into a match between them, which I guess means at the prices I'm supposed to talk about No Deal first. So I just thought looked in good form and uh, and should get a good trip through there and, and has numbers that are competitive. Nothing nothing terribly creative in my handicapping of, of this one. And Jump for Joy, I understand. I mean, you wouldn't want any shorter than two to one. Let's put it that way. But I, I did think it was interesting um, that it is a slight class drop with the last race coming against Colts. And I, I did feel like, well, I don't disagree with what you, the point you made about the pace last time. I thought it could be soft or soft ish today in here as well. So I'm going to try to get away with those two against the field and, and we'll see what, uh, we'll see what happens here in this eighth race at Belmont. They are leaving the paddock now. So we have a few minutes to chat about some breeders cup races in this buy sell hold format that some years we do more than others. We didn't do a ton of it this year with the, these future prices. How about this? Let's ask folks who are watching. Um, and producer Craig, maybe you can. Oh, actually, no. We can. We can actually see the comments right here from this. Right here from this window. So, f folks watching, you you pick us a couple of races. Well, first come, first serve, and we'll go ahead and uh, and play a little buy, sell, hold. But we'll start off with a race of my choosing, and that's going to be. Uh, you probably guess where I'm going with this. The Breeders' Cup Classic. Uh, <laughs> I, I just think it's such an interesting race. I'm, I think I have what I want to do pending the opportunity to look at the runners in the flesh because there's a couple of horses in here that um, I'll just feel so much better if I see them in the flesh and they're telling me they're ready to head in the right direction. But uh, we'll, we'll run through the, the, the top of the market with you, Matt Bernier, starting with uh, the current co-favorites, Improbable and Tis the Law, both listed at ten to three, so a hair over, uh, a hair over three to one on each of those. Uh, buy, sell, hold for the two of those. Yeah, look, not not offended by that price for either of them. Um, if if you were really interested in either horse, I would say fire away of the two uh, at those prices. I'd probably still lean more toward Improbable than I would Tis the Law. I think Tis the Law is going to take a step forward from that freshening. I shouldn't say step forward. I think he's going to benefit from the freshening. The problem is, and I say problem, it's not really a problem, but it's the way that I'm looking at it. I just thought Improbable's last race was so impressive. And I don't think he's really done anything wrong here in, 20, in 2020. And it just, at, at, if you're just giving me a heads up at the same number, I'm going to take Improbable over Tis the Law, acknowledging that I wouldn't fault anybody that liked Tis the Law at that number. We have a trio of runners in behind at six to one. They are authentic maximum security. Um, oh, and and one who's not running must just be a vestigial one because uh, Tom Seita is actually seven to one. I I was assuming he was going to be the other one at six, but it's actually some some bookie has has left McKinsey in the betting. So let's just <laughs> talk about authentic. Yeah, I'll, I'll lay the six on McKinsey all yeah, day. Yeah. Um, authentic and uh, maximum security any any buys or sells in there or are you uh, once again firmly in the hold camp yeah maybe i'm going to tip my hand a little bit i brought him up uh, last week i'm i'm more and more interested in authentic um uh, i having a difficult time imagining myself not picking him in the race to win um so that 6 I, is right on right on the mark uh, I, I love everything about that it's one of those i'm going to be fascinated to see you know, I, I heard an interview uh, Jeff Siegel from XBTV did with uh, Bob Baffert the other day. I, I'm going to be very interested to see the pace of this race because I acknowledge that global campaign has a little bit of early foot. I know maximum security, probably not going to be that far off of it. I But I, I keep going back and forth and I say, if if authentic and global campaign are the two that are setting the fractions, I think authentic can tuck him away whenever he wants. And if he can open up two or three lengths, I, I think everybody else is going to have to have their running shoes on. I just, I love the way this horse is coming into it from a, a sort of 
pattern standpoint, uh, I've talked about it ad nauseum. I believe in the paired up buyer tops sort of moving forward. I think you could get a forward move off of that. Maybe that moves him up into the 110 range. That's certainly fast enough to win. The running style with the profile of Keeneland going two turns fits him to a T. Uh, I also, for big weekends like this, I'll throw in other figures, not just the buyers and the time form ratings, but I threw in the thoroughgraph numbers. And if you're a fan of the sheets, I mean, he's he's sitting on a very, very impressive pattern. I'll put it that way uh, without giving away the information. I think Jerry Brown does a great job. It's... It's for me. It's authentic all day, every day of those two at six to one. All right, very, very interesting. And pace wise, I mean, it, it, there's zero chance that Baffert runners are going to duel with each other. And you've got Authentic and Max having the two best pace figures. So uh, I'm starting to come around to your way of uh, to your way of thinking here in terms of uh, of how how it might play out. You got to figure Max from security is going to be rated, and Authentic is going to be handled very aggressively this time around. Yes. How, I mean, how many times have we seen where we think, oh, there's going to be a ton of speed signed on, and then all of a sudden it's a lot more tepid than we thought it would be and if that's going to be the case if you're going to give me i don't i don't think i'm trying to think of a good way of putting this i don't think necessarily authentic got beat by a better horse in the preakness and i'm not saying that to disparage swiss skydiver i don't know that he was necessarily given the best opportunity to win given his sort of running style i think you're Agreed. supposed to let him out and go yeah. and and i think you i don't think there's any choice but to do that on saturday afternoon next week you're certainly not supposed to give the rail to on a good rail day to to a, a, a tough customer like Swiss Skydiver. I still think, um, you know that the you, you flip the trips and you, you flip the result. There. There's nothing wrong with authentic preakness. I agree. For some reason, I just can't. I intellectually understand everything you're saying, and I can't quite latch on. But will certainly be a horse that's on my tickets. For me, the buy at the prices is the next one in the market, and that's Tom's data again, pending the opportunity to see him in the flesh. I mean, all the the setbacks he's had, etc. I gotta figure if he's running here, it's because he's doing really well. I saw him for like twelve seconds this morning, schooling from the gate on uh, on TVG. He looked well in his coat and whatnot, from what I could see. But it's not the same as seeing him move. It's not the same as seeing him from ten feet away. These are things I'm hoping to do. But I'm super interested. Interested in Tom State who I know you've had ranked number one all year. So I, I got to imagine you'll have at least some Tom State over authentic backups. Yeah, he's just he's just rock solid. You know, he's really blossomed. He was always a horse that showed hints of ability, and unfortunately, he was just sort of an ouchy type. And and I can still say that he probably still is a bit of an ouchy type, but he's just really really strong. Matt is freezing for me. It could uh -oh. be my Craig. I am back. Oh, um, Matt is frozen Craig's for me. Oh, Craig, producer if you give Craig me a here. heads up I'm as just, to uh, if, if, if this is me or Matt like, or, or what's going like on. Are really you back, like, Matt? Is, is it me or is it Pete? It, on my end, it's It could Pete. be either one. I, it could be – I never lost anything on my end, but it – And now he's muted. What's We're going on, Craig? I think you're dealing with some dodgy hotel Wi-Fi. Okay, Matt, I could. Matt's be. pretty clear. Okay, are we still we're still broadcasting? You're we're making still, a nice little yeah, cameo. We're, on he's he's, we're he's still making live. I just I was typing and I was like, you know what? This I'm is fantastic. Come on in. On. It looks like we're back now. It looks like we're back now. Um, is yeah, this, is, is, is this folks, your debut? This might be the first time I've ever shown up on Horse Players Happy Hour. <laughs> this <is> fantastic. <laughs> I'm the man who makes the magic happen, people. We're we're only sad he's not going to be there at Keeneland uh, at Keeneland with us. Yeah, it's. The, the return of dodgy hotel Wi-Fi, but anyway, we we fought through. We're good. I think we've made <laughs> We're the back. we've made the points uh, that need making, and we feel good about that. We got to be getting very close to time at uh, at Belmont. Uh, how far they're away off. are we from? The, oh, they're even off. Great. I'll let you talk us through that uh, this race a little bit, Matt. I don't. I mean, I don't really see a, a ton of running going on. They went fast early on. I mean, you're trying to get some horses trying to rally from the back. They went 45 flat for the half mile. Um, it looks like you've got Jump for Joy out there. You've got uh, Cyrenek out there. You've got Glass Ceiling. It's it's not a, an overly encouraging finish. I think Jump for Joy might be okay. The one is angled out trying to come with some sort of a late bid. Going to make it reasonably close, but I think you're okay, Pete. I think you got Jump for Joy home. All right, nice. We'll take it. We'll take a good it. Good price, too. Two and a half to one. Oh, good. It went the yeah. right way. I, that's yeah. nice. It's it's rare and nice when that happens. With Speed horses don't often go the right way. So we'll, we'll, we'll especially take that. Let's get to some of the questions that have come in. All right. We have a few 
um, questions to go through races, which is great. And we will do that. But there's a few like individual questions. So sure. uh, thoughts on Chad's chances in the mile, specifically with Raging Bull and Digital Age, uh, neither one of which gets my blood pump in particularly. I, I feel like this is a race that's going to go to Europe. Uh, what are your thoughts on those two Chad Brown runners? Certainly wouldn't be the first time I left them out and he stuffed me in a locker. No, I'll tell you what, you know, specifically when you talk about a horse like Raging Bull, he's he's rock solid. He's fast. There's no denying that. But he came out of the run earlier this year in the Maker's Mark Mile. And I said that day, I don't think it's a good race. I just don't want any part of it. And then I go and look at the way the Shadwell Turf Mile was run. And I don't mean this is any disrespect to Ivar, the winner. But I almost feel like it was just the Maker's Mark Mile 2.0 and the Shadwell Turf Mile. I don't want any horse coming from that race. Digital Age, if I had to make a play of the two, that would be the one I'd be more interested in. That Turf Classic, uh, I think, has come back actually pretty live. You've got a number of 100 buyers uh, or north of that that have exited that race. I, I still don't know that I want to take him. It depends what kind of price he's going to be because I thought he just had such a dream setup in that run in the Turf Classic. There was a wicked pace signed on that day. He saved every inch of ground. I thought Javier gave him a beautiful ride. And yes, he got up and won. But I just, I, I almost feel like last time was the time, unless you're going to tell me that he's 15 to one in this go. And maybe he will be. He's not for me. Um, I got to be honest. I'm getting more and more interested in factor this. Um, I, I, I understand maybe you want to look at it and say he's a little bit on the, he's not as classy as some of the other runners. I, that, that run at Pimlico was really something to behold, given the ground. Some like at Hot Brown came and ran a hole in the wind last weekend at Belmont Park. Um, and this horse, he's just in raging form. I, he's the one that I'm leaning toward right now in a race that, admittedly, I think it's rather uh, rather murky. I like him in both uh, in uh, March to the Arch as well. I think he's sneaky. Uh, we have a question about the Tom's Day Tie International price. Best price available, seven to one right now. Uh, I got to think that's going to be considerably shorter. On well, I say considerably shorter, but the money's got to go somewhere, so it's so it's tricky. But I still think seven to one. If I if I seen him and loved him, I'd be backing that seven to one right now. Um, where are you with what his price should be? I think that's I think it's pretty close. I think he should be right around six, um, given the likelihood. I was talking to my buddy Mike Matnansky from uh, WEI in Boston the other sure. day, and. I, I get it. All the markets are suggesting that, you know, it'll be tis the law and it'll be improbable. I, I can't I can't help but think maximum security is going to be bad. And and not just in sort of that six to one, seven to one range. He is the one name that whether you're a diehard or you're a casual fan, there's not that people don't know tis the law or or the you know Derby and Preakness winner. Everyone knows maximum security because of what happened last year. I can't help but think he's going to take a little bit more money. And I wonder if a horse like Tom's Data is the beneficiary where he floats up a little bit into that six, seven to one range. We have another question, a very specific question about authentic. I'll, I'll let you answer this one. Do you think he is a need the lead type? You know, for the longest time I did. Um, but I don't think he's incapable of winning from a trip that is, let's say, pressing the pace. So if you perched him out in the clear two, three path, I'll just draw it up and say if a horse like Global Campaign wanted to go. Uh, I don't think he's incapable of winning from a trip like that. While on paper, it may look like he's a need-the-lead type, and I think he's at his best when he's on the lead. I don't think he absolutely has to have it. Now, if he's coming from two or three off of it, I don't like his chances nearly as much as I would when he's up there sort of pressing or dictating the pace. Um, I'll be very surprised if he's not on the lead. Yeah, I wouldn't call him a need-the-lead, but I would call him a – best when he can be on the yeah. lead and if he can make the lead he should make the lead mm -hmm. I, I that's how i would uh, stipulate Agreed. that um we have a question am i crazy to press a send quality Boldora was supposed to be a lock we all know how that went i guess referring oh there's the question um right up on screen how nifty is that um referring to jackie's warrior i'm sure in all the uh, market attention that he's sure to uh, that he's sure to get. In fact, let's dovetail this because we had a question to buy, sell, hold the juveniles. So, so I'll, I'll pull that up. But, but uh, start with the, your thoughts on essential quality. Crazy to press him? No, I mean, I, I think anytime you can get a horse who is one at the distance and at the track with a bit of a versatile running style, I think that's a, a definitely a feather in the cap. And he's not going to be the favorite. I'm I'm going back and forth on this race. This is one of the ones that I'm finding to be rather difficult to draw any sort of really super strong conclusion. Um, you know, if you're simply a numbers player, Jackie's Warrior is very very difficult to beat. Um, the one turn to two turn thing doesn't 
terribly bother me, but I also think it's far from a slam dunk. I wouldn't just assume that he's going to do it. He did something in the champagne that I'm sure folks, again, if, if you don't care about lead changes, doesn't make a difference to you. He was extremely early to change leads, which I think is even worse than being late to change leads. And I don't know if that was just because Belmont Park is, you know, you've got those big wide sweeping turns and whatever the case may be. But while we're talking about an inexperienced horse, he's arguably one of the most experienced in this field. I didn't love that. From a number standpoint, he's way the horse to beat. But I just, he's going to take some pressure early on. I have to think. I find it fascinating that Baffert sends this other horse in here off of a maiden win just, what, two weeks ago to stretch him out. I can't imagine him being far off the pace. Um, it's it's a race that I, I'm having a very difficult time having a, a strong opinion on. 13 to 8 the current price on Jackie's Warrior so a little bit better than uh, a little bit better than 3 to 2 um uh, that, that's I would a pass buy. for me I, that's interesting i think i would buy i i mean i don't know we'll, we'll we'll see we'll have so much more information we'll be able to do some more race design i certainly wouldn't be laying it i can guarantee you that would, would, would you uh you know if you were if you were in the laying business would you lay that horse no, no, not not at that kind of number, simply because, I, I again, he's the fastest horse in the race, but kind of stealing Harvey Pack's old adage, I mean, never bet a favorite doing something for the first time. And he's not only is he doing it for the first time, he's doing it against, I think, a pretty good group of horses. So I, I just, boy, I, taking a horse going two turns for the first time against other speed, which he's, he's faced other speed in the past, don't get me wrong, I just... Boy, I, I I would be very reluctant to take anything too short. I'll give you the others in single digits for any comments you have about the prices. Essential quality seven to two, reinvestment risk eight, sitting on go nine to one. Any of those move you? Sitting on go is mildly intriguing. Um, I don't know that the running style is going to really work for Keeneland. I, I would still rather be a little bit closer than farther off of it. But uh, his Iroquois, I think, is actually stacking up pretty decent. I thought he ran really well, and the numbers look okay. Um, I, I guess of the horses you just listed, it would either be him or essential quality that I'd be most interested in at their prices. Yeah, I, I need to spend a little bit more time with essential quality. I'm getting that. I'm getting that intuition about Jackie's warrior, but I mean, as as everybody's pointing out in the comments, these things, uh, you know, it is it is it, it is racing, and it's not always as simple as the fastest horse winning. So I, I don't want to I don't want to give the others too much short shrift. We have a, a question to go over the distaff as well. That'll be a, uh, that'll be a fun one. Um, we'll start, I guess, with a, the, just the, the the most general of questions: Is this one? Uh, Matt, to you, a match between Swiss Skydiver and Monomoy Girl, or is it a little bit more complicated than that? I mean, th they are, I would say, not, not far and away, but they are certainly the two horses to beat. And, and Monomoy Girl, I would put her a pretty legitimate favorite over Swiss Skydiver even. Um, if, if it's not Monomoy Girl, obviously it could be Swiss Skydiver. I would be more inclined to look at a horse like Horologist, who I think she may have been hurt a little bit by... The track, the day that she ran in La Troyenne against Monomoy Girl, she was down on the inside. I've heard enough people that I respect suggest that the inside wasn't where you wanted to be that day. And uh, while it doesn't look good on paper, if you draw a line through that suggesting there, you know, maybe she just kind of got worked over because of the trip or, or where she was positioned, you're dealing with a horse who's coming in on the heels of a couple of graded stakes wins, both of them 100 or better buyers. She has a versatile running style. I, I just, I kind of get the vibe that she still doesn't get the credit she deserves. I think she's a better horse than people are giving her credit for. Um, it, I, I Push comes to shove. I think Monomoy Girl wins, but Horologist is definitely intriguing to me. That's interesting. We'll get we'll get there. Let's talk some prices. So um, a bit of disagreement on Monomoy Girl. Best price I'm seeing out there is uh, is eleven to eight. So between six to five and and seven to five, I guess that is in USA style prices. I mean, it feels it's certainly not crazy. I wouldn't be laying it, um, but it doesn't it doesn't motivate me either. It's squarely in the hold camp. Whereas I'm seeing some only one firm, but there is some three to one out there about Swiss Skydiver, uh, that might be game, set, match for me with, with as progressive as she is. And I know I just talked about how maybe the race uh, the other day in the, in the, in the uh, Preakness was flattered, but, but I still just think of what she's capable of. Um, three to one, so that, that's a, I think that's a buy for me. 
Yeah, I mean, I, I I don't know that I would argue with that. I think of the two. I, I, I my heart says Monomoy Girl's more talented, um, but we're also dealing with a three year old who it's not out of the realm of possibility still is improving as opposed to a five year old mare who I kind of feel like what you see is what you've got. And and that that's far from a bad thing. I mean, all she does is win races. Um, <laughs> He's great. But at, but at three to one, I, again, it's another instance where I wouldn't be taking, but I can understand anyone who would draw up that case and say, look, this is, she is not, you know, the, the difference between the two, one doesn't win the race three more times than the other one does. And I, I totally understand that. A uh, horologist out there at 16 to one. I assume you would be buying that one. Yeah. I don't think she'll end up there. I think uh, at least here day of, I think she's probably closer to 12. Um, but yeah, I, I just, she's another one. I don't think if, and especially if you're strictly playing the odds game, which I get it, that's what this is. It's a difficult thing, you know, trying to work it in this way because there's, you talk about who you think is better than other horses. And if everything goes the way it's supposed to, I think this horse wins, but the price isn't there. Horologist to me, I don't think she is that far behind those top two, put it that way. All right. If folks have other Breeders' Cup questions, hit us up. We've got about 20 minutes left. We'll follow this next race at Belmont. We'll talk about that at some point. Hopefully we can give you out another winner. And uh, then we'll, we'll wait. We'll get a leaderboard. We'll recap that. We'll let folks go. We'll let me get back to editing. Uh, I'm trying to wrap my day up here at some point so I can get into some of this uh, pumpkin carving. That's the hope anyway. Uh, but hit us up with your Breeders' Cup questions. We'll keep them going. The next question we have is specifically about the sprint. Uh, somebody looking for thoughts about Nashville, um, who I would imagine the first question is, is he actually going to turn up here? I know there's been some back and forth. Um, Let's assume that the, the price I'm about to offer you, Matt, is non-runner no bet, which it's not. I'm sure this is an action bet. But just mm -hmm. for the purposes of our conversation, I don't want you to have to price in will he run, will he won't run. If sure. Nashville turns up in the gates, is 8-1 to one a price that you would accept? Oh, well, I mean, run to the window. How, <laughs> how much can you get down? At 8-1? At to one, <laughs> I, I think if, if he shows up, it, really, it's a fascinating sort of dynamic because arguably the two speeds of the speeds are the Asmussen horses. And, I, you know, one of them is extremely lightly raced. The other one is very lightly raced. And, I, you know, of the two, I there's something there's something about a horse when they go out there and win the way that they do, the way that Nashville has. And this, this is not meant to be a knock against Yalpon. Nashville has just he never got out of first gear in that run at Keeneland most recently. And I can't help but give him some bonus points for winning at the track at the distance. Um, if you could get eight. Yeah. I mean, I, I would take that in a heartbeat, especially like, to your point, if it were, you know, no run, no, no wager. But if, if it's a matter of action play, I still would be considering it because I think if he runs, I gotta be honest, I think he's vying for favoritism. Yeah, it's 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 a great point, um, and we'll know a lot more about that as we get closer. Uh, let me give you the other single digit odd horses if you have any uh, buys sells buys or sells among them. Otherwise, we'll just assume hold. Vacoma seven to two, Yalpon seven to two, CZ Rocket seven to one, and that's it in terms of single digit runners. It's those four right now for the Breeders' Cup Sprint. Uh, I wouldn't be biting. Uh, there's another horse in there that I like it, uh, which would be a better number. Ooh, uh, <laughs> should I keep going up the ladder or do you just want to tell us? No, go a little bit farther. Okay. Uh, looking into double digits, Diamond Dupes 10, Forensic yeah, there Fire. Uh, oh, we didn't have to go very far, didn't, didn't we? Didn't go far. Didn't have to go far. <laughs> um, I, I Yeah, I, I would be more interested based on the way I think the race could set up if they all go. Um, I think Diamond Dupes pulls a very similar trip to the one that he did in the Phoenix. And if he can run back to that, I think he's uh, I think he's right there and and at a very very fair price at 10 to 1. Uh, Pappy and Cohn does not have a strong record in the Breeders' Cup races. I think he's something on the order of 0 for 20. Does that give you any pause at all with a runner like Diamond Oops? Yeah, certainly. I mean, I you know, feel like we all kind of got chastised for bringing it up with John Sadler a couple of years ago and he he got off the duck, but I mean, look, when you get to a sample of that size, I mean, you you have to acknowledge it. I, I think it would be, you know, irresponsible to just kind of poo poo it and not not bring it up so over oh, 20 yeah it's not great um i just this horse this horse continues to run better races than i expect him to and and maybe he'll be exposed against uh, the best of the best but um i was really taken by that keeneland race especially given the way that 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 track going six furlongs and again maybe i'm making a case for the alpines the the nashvilles of the world but 
that track at six furlongs over this fall meeting was really cranked up to horses that were on the lead. And for him to rally the way that he did, uh, I thought was very impressive. We had a question about the Natalma. You mentioned before, Matt, the idea that that buyer might be a bit light. Does that mean that Alda could potentially be a sneaky play for you in the juvenile Phillies turf? Yeah, I'm at least considering her. Um, to me, this is an interesting race where, you know, Aunt Pearl, I think she's strictly the horse to beat. Uh, I don't know that that's really a, a brilliant opinion. I think many people kind of share the same idea. Um, I thought Spanish Love Affair ran really well to run second. I could easily see sort of the horses that made up the exact in the Jessamine coming back and doing it again here next Friday. Um, Plum Alley, I think, makes plenty of sense in here. I, I thought she looked very, very well winning up at uh, – at Belmont most recently. And, and you've got a couple other interesting ones. You obviously have got Wesley Ward's horses, but as far as Alda is concerned, if you think the number, like I had speculated, could be a little bit on the lighter side, I think distance is her friend. And I get it. She went the one turn mile most recently, but I think a two turn is going to be better for her. And she should have some pace to run at. I, I think she's interesting. I guess it would just depend on what kind of price you were talking about. Uh, and, and currently let's, let's take a, let's take a look at that. Um, Alda right now looks like about 16 across the board. Yeah, I mean, that's I, I don't know that I'd go much lower than that, given that I really think Aunt Pearl is the goods. And then, like I said, I brought up uh, the Clement Philly as well as um, uh, the couple that, that Ward don't could forget, potentially yeah, have. Campanelli, man. Campanelli is super interesting to me. I mean, we've seen Wesley Ward win one of these juvenile races off the morning before. Grant, it was, uh, it was Hoot Nanny, another horse that – you know, I, I was, this is one of those, I touched the hot stove back in, I think that was 14 too. And I was like, oh, I don't think he'll stay. And, and you know, and I, I think Campanelli is better than, than he was. So, and, and there's another a great fact. Oh, I get to give a shout out to one of my old favorites. Rob Dove, one of the top 10 pro punters in the UK today, made the point to me that the morning was run into a headwind, making that race even more impressive. I, I'm going to, I might uh, make a few phone calls and see about getting a little of this five to one on Campanelli. I think it's, I think it's interesting. Who knows? Maybe you'll get it on the day because a lot of very sharp people think to think seem to think that Aunt Pearl is a free square, and she's certainly going to be on all of my tickets. But uh, you know, I, I I feel like I can't get off Campanelli at this point. Um, she she was uh, good to us at, at Royal Ascot and has only improved since. Can can you see her if you squint? Well, to be honest, no, no, I don't even need to squint. Um, I, you know, to be honest, though, she is part of the reason that I may have pulled back on how bullish I was about Aunt Pearl because, I mean, she's I th she broke out in each of her past two just a hair. I don't think it was anything egregious, but she was also, I thought, a little bit keen in that most recent run, and and I can't imagine her not being part of the pace. And if all of a sudden, you know, maybe that's the difference where Aunt Pearl she got out there, and, and yes, she went fast early on, but she, she didn't really have. I don't want to say quality pressure throughout but she really didn't have anybody breathing down her neck throughout maybe she's just that good but i can't imagine campanelli just kind of cruising out there giving her a length length and a half head start and then trying to run her down i think she's probably there you know neck and neck the entire way and then does that sort of sap the energy out of both of them perhaps setting it up for somebody from coming from just off of it so i i respect again this is a race where i've got five horses highlight six horses highlighted and i don't know if it's one that I'll have a ton of money involved in for the contest, simply because, again, a lot of it will just depend on the pace situation, who does and doesn't go. Um, but I could see I could see arguably those two hooking up and, and maybe to, sort of to their own demise. It could set it up for something, something crazy and interesting to happen. One, we've had a bunch of Euro questions. So folks looking for full Euro info, I refer you. And thank you for the uh, Twitter shout out on this the other day. The but show I did with, with Nick Luck the other day. Uh, where we went through every single one, maybe one or two slipped through the cracks, but it sounds better when I say we went through every <laughs> single one of the European runners. You can find that over at inthemoneypodcast.com, along with a ton of other uh, Breeders' Cup content that's going to be uh, flowing in over the course of the next several days. So if you want the comprehensive deal, go there. The, 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 the Euro that he thought was interesting underneath, and I can't disagree with him at all in the race we've been talking about, the Juvenile Phillies turf, is Ud, Ud Nadata. Um, just want to, to to throw out there to take a little bit of an extra look at, and you can hear Nick make his case for that. Uh, a few of these other general Euro questions, I mean, we're not going to go through them all here. A couple of the ones that I'm the most interested in, Tornawa is the single one that I am the most interested in. I think she's got every chance in the turf. I think you can make a case that she's the best middle distance turf horse in Europe. 
coming here and she isn't going to be the favorite. I mean, she's not going to be um, unloved in the market by any means, but I think there's going to be a lot of stories um, around the, the other two big euros in the race in magical and mogul. And, and I think Tarnawa has credentials equal to those at what should be hopefully the outsider of the three in that spot. When it comes to the Breeders' Cup turf, Matt, do you give the home team any chance at all? You know, for the longest time, I didn't. Um, basically, all year, I've been saying our, our turf horse is just it, it's ripe for a Euro. Uh, and then there was one horse that um, he he kind of won me over his, with his most recent start. Um, I, I Maybe it was as simple as putting the blinkers on. I thought Arklow was really good at Kentucky Downs over rather testing ground. Um, for him to open up the way that he did at the very end of that run, we've seen the Kentucky Downs form holding up so well at Keeneland. The horses that go from that sort of undulating track, especially coming from days where there was some sort of given the turf to go to Keeneland, and it's as if they're running on blacktop. They can just get out there and they're cruising. Um, he at least is making me think twice about my just pure European stance. Um, after listening to what you and Nick were talking about, and, and I had already kind of had this opinion before, and I know Nick said he's not entirely convinced. I'm curious, again, what your thoughts are. To me, that last run from Mogul, granted it was against three-year-old restricted company, to me it looked like the three-year-old who is continuing to put it together, and maybe that was sort of the aha moment. I love that that was over firm going. I know he scraped the paint the entire way, but boy, you want to talk about a big, big turn of foot. I thought it was really impressive, um, and he's the, he's the European I'm most interested in. Yeah, I can't blame you. I mean, I think it's a really good race between the three. So I'm picking the one who I feel like I have the most personal angle on and, uh, you know, with the sort of the trip stuff coming out of the last race. I, I just think that race was even better than it looked. But there's nothing wrong with Mogul. There's nothing wrong with Magical. I'd be surprised if Arklo can hang with them, but Arklo has – punched me in the face, pulled down my pants in public. He's he hit me with the pie in the face. It's, it's amazing what that horse has done to me in his, in his career. So I, I, I would not, I, I say this not to talk anybody off the, the USA horse and it all, it's all situational, but um, channel maker at double digits with as, as good as he's gotten. Um, if he can just go out there and wing and the European riders don't take him seriously, I'd have some channel maker as, as a backup, I think. So channel maker is, to me as our is to you. <laughs> so, so this is one where look, based on his form, he is, he's feeling himself. He is, he's ready to roll. I just, I remember being convinced and I get it. It was a really difficult spot going against the navel and magical and, and the, the turf was far from kind. But I mean, if apparently people think that he's, he's a horse that loves the sort of cut in the ground, what was the excuse for the breeders cup at Churchill a few years ago when I loved him at seven to one or was it yeah, eight to one? on the heels of a blowout win in the Joe Hirsch and he was nowhere. And I just, did they send him that day? I can't remember how it went, he went right I to always, the front. Okay. Yeah, and just, and I, he's just, when, when I'm off, he wins. When I'm on, he loses. <laughs> so put a ring around him. He's in, he'll so, have his picture. So we've just, we've just given the people the arc load yeah. channel maker. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, it can't, it can't happen with those big three euros in there. It just can't, it just can't even happen. Uh, we'll get to this next race at Belmont in a minute, but we have a couple we can we can rapid fire throw. Is six furlongs too short for Vacoma? Uh, it is a concern that it might be too sharp. Absolutely. Um, I also think, though, that sometimes when you get like wildly crazy paces, a six furlong can start to play like seven. The Breeders' Cup sprint is a race where that can happen. I wouldn't underestimate him. I'm not crazy about him as the favorite. He is a, a use but not press for me in my horizontals. Uh, your thoughts, Matt? Yeah, I mean, he, he's to me, he would be interesting if people sort of just immediately dismissed him and he floated up a little bit. But at the same time, this sort of lengthy layoff with what I think is a very talented field, um, I think it's a lot to ask going three quarters. Frankly, I would probably rather him at a mile going to two turns. Um, but I can, you know, again, George Weaver will, will do what he thinks needs to be done here. Um, he's not for me, but I, I wouldn't fault anybody that said they liked him. It is interesting that there's been a ton of horses who've done very well in the sprint off of, off of layoffs. There's two things I've noticed about the sprint over the years. One is I'm tempted to say layoffs are going to be issues and they, historically haven't been and here's a really really weird one horses that haven't worked particularly well or looked particularly good have it's not been any kind of problem 
in the sprint. I had, I mean, horses I've seen the, the week of that I, I've gone like, you know, I'm not sure Run Happy's really looking that good. I work all week. I love him on paper. Uh, it's not moving that fluidly. I mean, you hear horse people talk about how Kona Gold used to train. He looked like a claimer. <laughs> and you saw the things he did in the race. I, so, th so that's just a just a general note to throw out there. If you hear me or anybody else talking about how a horse isn't looking their best or whatever, I'm not saying oh bet the horse because they don't look good. I'm just saying don't hold it against them in the sprint. Just a little uh, a little piece of uh, of general sprint advice there. Let's see how many minutes do we have at Belmont? Is it time to talk about this race? Got about two minutes. Uh, I I wonder if the Naira graphics are kind of uh, jacked up today because they just have a. A little piece that says race nine post time four fifty seven. No odds anywhere. So Oh, that's weird. Yeah. That's I wonder if they're weird. just having a little technical issue. Yeah. Let's talk about this race now since we don't know. I don't want to leave people out in the cold. Um, what'd you like? Yeah, I mean, th this one was, I think, more of a an obvious sort of idea. Granted, we're dealing with a lengthy layoff, but I went with the seven cost basis for Chad. We haven't seen this one since an allowance try down at Gulfstream at the end of February. Uh, showed some speed, faded at the end. Obviously, he's been laid up since then. This is a move that Chad has had success with. Uh, I like that this horse has already shown the ability to rally from off the pace. Doesn't have to have the lead in order to be successful. Uh, I have no idea about the wet track. We'll find out. You know, I'll find out just as soon as everybody else does. Um, but at last, I saw he was five to two, which I I have to be honest, I think is is pretty okay for a horse like this. Yeah, that's a, that makes sense. One of the contenders for sure. I was wondering if Foolish Ghost couldn't maybe shake away from these. Um, not taking a ton of money. The last I saw, of course, it's tricky with these with these uh, graphics. Was four to one off a morning line of seven to two. The last I saw, I would I would be inclined to give that one a little bit of a try as they're going behind the gate here. You can see if you're watching along on a second screen, you can see the rider aboard the two foolish ghosts posting, uh, asking that that's typically a sign that a horse is going to be asked for early speed foolish ghost getting up on the toes now. And uh, yeah, we'll see, we'll see what happens in, in race nine at Belmont. Do you have any other uh, wagering thoughts on that one? Or should we get back to some breeders cup stuff? No, that was about it. I, I like Chad off the layoff and, and who knows, we'll find out if we get burned, but um, I think the price is right. A general question about how Euros like the Keeneland turf. You know, it always depends. And you do see sometimes European horses, especially big galloping types. Um, if you hear that, if you see those kind of descriptions of a European runner, sometimes the tight turns aren't great for them. But other times, uh, sort of like what I was saying about the sprint, how it can play longer. If there's enough pace, it can bring stamina into play. In general, I'd have... I'd have no concerns about Keeneland being a problem. If there's a problem for a Euro, it might just be um, the the tight turns and their ability to get around them. With, with, there really aren't a lot of top-level European races run left-handed. So it would be nice. I mean, Leopardstown off often is a very good pointer for horses who can run in the USA. I don't think we have any this year, but just on a historical basis, you love a horse that can get around Chester as one that's going to love um, USA racing. But I think you kind of have to take it on a case-by-case -case basis. Uh, Nick makes some educated guesses about that on the other show if you want any more, uh, any more info as far as that one goes. Another question for you, Matt. Um, mean Mary. Uh, mm -hmm. what do we think, what do we think about, uh, mean Mary's chances, um, at the Breeders' Cup this year? Do we know, I'm having a, a, a brain misfire, which race I know she's cross centered, but I think they expressed a strong preference. First preference is the Philly and Mare turf. Uh, I would rather her in the turf simply because I think that speed plays better out a mile and a half than it does at a mile and three sixteenths. I, to be honest, I think the Philly and Mare turf may be deeper than the turf as well. So, you know, it is what it is, but, I, I maintain, I like her. I think the talent is there. And again, the running style, I would just, for those of you that were paying attention to Keeneland, Graham Motion had a filly named uh, Blame Debbie, who basically ran the way that I would love to see Mean Mary do so in the turf, where they just went out there at a mile and a half. And it may not have been the most brilliant performance. And again, we're dealing with two totally different classes. But it, that's basically the trip that I would have envisioned for her against the boys on turf as opposed to the Philly and Mare turf where there is a little bit of other early foot in there. I think it's a distance. It's probably a hair sharper than what her sort of speed is an asset for. Um, and again, rut boy, I just, I don't have a ton of interest in trying to, I don't want to say this. This is going to sound bad because she only lost by a neck to rushing fall, but rushing fall at Keeneland at this distance, she's going to be an absolute monster to beat. 
Yeah, I was the only thing I guess you could say from the point of view of me and Mary is can the distance, can the added distance maybe be a little bit of an equalizer? Um, it sounds I mean, like you see it the other way almost. I just watching that run at Key, at uh, Saratoga again in the Diana, I just I don't think she was ever going to beat Rushing Fall. And that doesn't mean that you can't turn the tables on her, but at the same time, I just I don't know. I think she's better if you really allow her to stretch out to to an elongated distance. Looks like we gave him the exacta here at Belmont as they passed the eighth pole, and you you just put me away. I I could – no, it looks like I should hang on for a second here. I'm hoping so, but it looks like it's going to come 7-2. Hopefully some folks followed us in and get a little something there. price. Got four and a half to one on this horse. That's tremendous. I thought I was going to get closer to two. Yeah, you said five to two was acceptable, yeah. and you got nine yeah. to two. Great pick, yeah. great pick. That's good. good. Exactly. I, that exact has got to be nice. Yeah, we we hopefully some folks followed us in there. That's good stuff. Sixty-two so that, for two. Wow, that's fantastic. All right, yeah. well, and we'll say this: it, 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 this is a serious thing. And this, whether you're talking about this show or uh, you know horses you pick up on from the Mapreneur show or stuff you hear, uh, anything on in the Money uh, Network, if if you do score out because of something we said. You know, we, we don't take tips, but we do encourage people to donate to charity. So yeah. uh, the TAA and the Thoroughbred Retirement Foundation, two great places. If you do score out, you want to give something back to the horses that are, you know, the center of, of what we do here. TBAfterCare.com for the TAA. And then, of course, uh, oh, there it is. Producer <laughs> Craig, Johnny on the spot. Um, there's a couple of things you could do. TRFInc.org slash players. But this is one of the best things to do. The, the Badge of Honor t-shirt is just awesome. After Matt, after you win the Breeders' Cup betting challenge, I want to see you wearing one of these. I won and so did they. Um, it's a I'll t-shirt. <laughs> it comes with a $75 donation uh, baked in to TRF. It's a $100 t-shirt. It is a gorgeous t-shirt and, and might well be worth that much on its own, but it comes with a $75 donation baked in. You can find that. Um, what's the best way to get that? Maybe in the money podcast.com slash old smoke might be the best way to, 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 to find that one. You can probably find it also over at trfinc.org slash players. Very proud of that one and proud of, um, you know, the money we've been able to raise this year for both the TAA and the TRF. Uh, it's really something that makes me feel uh, very proud. Um, Before we get off that topic, I mean, what would you say? Would you think uh, me and Mary better against the girls or against the boys going long? Oh, it's tough. I mean, I, I think not having to deal with Russian fall might ultimately um, – be be what pointed me in the direction of the turf just the idea of trying to just wing on the lead but it's tough with channel maker in there and it's tough with those euros i i i get it i you know i get it just hoping hoping that something goes amiss with rushing fall and just trying to take the race to her and hoping you can outstay her or hoping you get cut in the ground i mean chad brown has said many times that uh to, to i don't think he said this about rushing fall specifically but the idea that cut in ground can be kryptonite to his horses i i wouldn't think uh, be any kind of issue for me and mary it's it's an interesting it's an interesting showdown. I think eventually they both might um, set it up for, uh, for for one of the Euros, but it's hard to leave either one of them off my tickets completely. What do you think? No, I mean, look, I, I think the quality. I mean, uh, and and you know what? Especially when you go back and take a look. Uh, Sister Charlie, there's a part of me that just thinks she's a little bit long in the tooth coming out of that Diana. Maybe she's not what she once was. But Starship Jubilee came right back and won the Wood by Mile. So, th- I mean, it may have only been a five-horse field, but it was about as good as you could put together for North American horses. So I, I think wherever Mean Mary goes, and obviously rushing fall in the Philly and Mare turf, uh, I think you have to respect them. Yeah, it's a tough, that's a tough race. Now, if we didn't get to your race, I know we've had some folks ask about other races. We're, we're going to be doing everything next week. So don't you don't have to, uh, don't sweat it. We're going to be going through all 14. We'll figure out a way to credit. It. It'll be a long, but we'll have to do an hour and a half for that show. And even at that, it's going to be rushed. But we'll, we'll we'll make it happen. We've also got the the monster pods sponsored by the Breeders Cup. Those are going to be dropping as soon as I get them edited. Um, maybe I'll be cheeky and drop the Friday tonight and save the Saturday for tomorrow. Right? I mean, that's it's rather than just dropping three hours of content on people. Maybe I should divide it divide it up like that. What do you think? Well, I think also too, it just kind of keeps that appetite strong. You know, give them give them a little taste and then give them the uh, the entree tomorrow. <laughs> I guess I guess it depends. There you go. I entree. guess it depends. If you think Friday is actually the entree, it depends what race and what horses you love. 
It's true. I mean, I'm super interested in Friday, Future Stars Friday, but I mean, for me, this Saturday is uh, is what it's. That's what it's all about. I've really warmed to the two day Breeders' Cup over the years, um, but Saturday Breeders' Cup is is a day of racing like no other, and uh, I'm just psyched. I'm, and it's going to be, you know, covering the Breeders' Cup betting challenge isn't going to be that easy this year with very few people on site. But that that's why you know I'm relying on you, JK. You guys, if you can just stay at the top of the leaderboard, I can just keep calling you up and then we don't have to worry about a thing hey feel free to i I believe don't quote me on this it could be wrong i think the position that edzo and i eddie olchuk will be set up i think we're going to be in the green room and that's where we're i believe that's what i've been told a few weeks ago that may have changed um but wherever we end up setting up shop come and talk to us because he's playing as well that's right. Eddie's a great horse player um, and somebody who I've been meaning to, I've been have a, had a note to, to, to reach out to, to bother for various things. So we'll, we'll, we'll get a chance to reconnect and catch up there. Okay. We're just about done. We do have a little bit more business left starting with giving the names of the 10 people who punched their ticket into tomorrow's event. I'm not going to do the scores. You can look that up online if you're interested. And producer Craig will put it up on screen. Ah, who we mentioned before, Stephen Close ends up getting the out now win. David Browning, Kevin Harrell, John J. Macklin, Kenneth P. Yingling, Mark Rudy, Lee Davis, Thomas Bryan, Chuck Lefebvre, and James Costello. Um, that's a it was it it stayed pretty. I guess that makes sense. We had logical results, and we didn't see a ton of change in the two races that we had on. A few names mixing things up there. They'll go on to compete on Saturday. You can, too. $129 to get into that one. There'll be more feeders and things as well. Horseplayers.com is your place to go for all that information. Matt, any closing thoughts from you before we get out of here? No, look, if you're behind on your work, get to work. You're running out of time. <laughs> I, I, I know I've been saying it for weeks now, but you got to you gotta lock in here because we can see the finish line. Like PTF when he ran the New York City Virtual the other day. <laughs> you can see the finish line. You got to lock in and know what's on the other side. So do your work. Be prepared. Obviously, listen to InTheMoneyPodcast.com and everything that we've got coming out because it's just – it's to me it's just it's so it's the best time of the year i feel like a little kid leading into christmas i really do it's exciting stuff can't wait thank you matt bernier thank you producer craig for making his cameo pushing all the right buttons as usual dj unstable himself craig gorbanoff great great work thank you to our friends at the breeders cup we've said it before we'll say it again check out all the coverage you can watch in the mornings on TVG. Also, one thing I haven't talked about enough, going to be a lot of amazing extra feeds and amazing stuff to bring you closer to the action than ever before. Over at breederscup.com, you can find about all of the different camera angles and stuff we've got going on. we got to get Pete Rotundo on here to, to give us the full lowdown. He's the man on the inside with all the good TV stuff. And hey, while we're at it, we'll thank him as well for all his support, as well as everybody over at the Breeders' Cup. Most of all, though, we want to thank you, the viewers and listeners, for making these shows so much fun to do throughout this bizarre year. This has been a great constant to come back to. These horse player happy hours, love doing them. We're going to find a way to continue making them ride. And, of course, we got uh, hopefully what will be the best one of all next week with uh, you, me, and JK going over all 14 Breeders' Cup races. This show has been a production of In the Money Media. Our business manager is Drew Cotney. Our chief creative officer is Jonathan Ginchin. I'm Peter Thomas Fornital. May you win all your Breeders' Cup photos. <laughs>